Perfect. All right, welcome everyone to um, this virtual symposium. So this is our third International Virtual Symposium on Development in African Theatre. All right, welcome everyone to um, this virtual symposium. So this is our third International Virtual Symposium on Development in African Theatre. All right, welcome everyone to um, Okay, just give me a minute. Um, it could virtual Okay. That, is the echo gone? It's gone, but you know, it's already a, a message of polyvocality. So amazing. We started well, we've started really well. <laughs> amazing. Thank you. All right. Thrice lucky. Um, so we'll start again. So welcome to uh, this third in a series of our International Virtual Symposium. This was started during the pandemic as a response to some of the amazing creativity that we're seeing on the continent and elsewhere in the diaspora within the uh, field of African theater and performance. Um, uh, this, the third one uh, is happening this year because last year uh, for different logistical reasons, we didn't quite get to it. And we've got a really exciting lecture today by our, our, our special guest lecture, um, Associate Professor Ali Walsh, uh, who I'm going to introduce in a minute. Before then, just to introduce us, uh, uh, for those of us that maybe are new to the African Theatre Association, uh, just to say welcome. My name is uh, Professor Kene Iguonu. I'm the president of the African Theatre Association. Uh, in my day job, I'm Pro Vice Chancellor at London College of Communication at the University of Arts London. And um, just a couple of tips before we start, so you know, uh, this um, uh, live uh, 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 lecture is being broadcast live on YouTube. Um, please uh, keep your, uh, you're welcome to put your videos on. Actually, we encourage you to put your videos on, um, uh, but we do please keep the microphones muted. Um, at the end of uh, uh, Professor Ali's lecture, we are going to invite questions, which you can type into the chat, or if you indicate by raising up your virtual hand, we will invite you to ask that question live as well. But other than that, please do keep your um, sounds muted uh, so that we can all have a good experience. All right. Um, what else? Um, try to uh, minimize dis uh, distractions wherever you, 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 you are, you're joining us from so that you can also enjoy the lecture. Um, as for, for those of you that know early, you know that you're in for a great lecture today. Um, for those of you that don't know, uh, you, you, be, you indeed have an amazing one today. So I've talked about muting the mics. Um, using the chat functions for the uh, questions at the end, but also feel free to um, ask those questions, raise your virtual hands for those questions to be asked. So, what is it about? What is African Theatre Association, or uh, as we say, AFTA? Um, AFTA is an international membership association. Um, the organization, uh, uh, the AFTA as so an organization, started in 2006. And the founding president is in the person of uh, Professor Osito Okabwe uh, of Goldsmith University London. It had its first uh, symposium. So it was launched by, with a symposium on Africa and women in African theater and performance. And that was in 2006 at Goldsmith. Um, following that symposium in 2006, it had its first annual conference in 2007. At the same time, it also launched its uh, uh, flagship uh, journal, peer review journal, the African Performance Review, in the same year, 2007. Uh, APR, as we say, as we call it, the African Performance Review, is a peer review journal of the association. It's published twice yearly. It is dedicated to publishing, disseminating, and encouraging high quality research and information on African theater and performance, both in the continent, Africa, but also anywhere in the diaspora that African theater and performance or culture is found. Um, like I said, it was launched in 2007 with an inaugural issue um, titled Women in African Theater and Performance. So ju just to kind of give you a little bit about what the association is about, um, 
the mission of African Theatre Association is to help define and shape African theatre theater scholarship and pedagogy uh, by liberating it from a bondage to non-African discursive framework. And this, of course, this, uh, these are debates about the framework for analyzing uh, and critiquing African theatre as the ongoing. And what African Theatre Association tries to do is to really lead that debate. And we have been doing that since 2006, like I said. Um, after um, facilitates um, the exploration and communication of African theatre and performance traditions, processes and practices through its conferences and other events, as well as our publications. It facilitates the advancement of education in the study and practice of African theatre and performance. And this is done primarily by providing a regular forum for uh, scholarly uh, um, exchange, um, for scholars practitioners to also meet and exchange ideas knowledge and information on African theatre and performance. It publishes, disseminates and encourages research in the field, like I said before, and it provides information on African theatre and performance to those who, to the wider public who are seeking that information. The association is governed by its constitution and bylaws, um, and um, the organ responsible for administering is the executive body, like most other associations, of which I'm president. Some other members of the executive committee are here, uh, like uh, uh, Dr. Oladipo Abolaje, who is our treasurer, and uh, uh, Dr. Shola Ademi, uh, who is the incoming president. My tenure finishes in July, so I'll be handing over to uh, Dr. Shola Ademi. Membership is open to all academics, researchers, practitioners, or students who have an interest in study, practice, or promotion of African theater. So if you're an Africanist out there and you're not a member of the association, I encourage you to get in touch. And you can find out details of how to become a member on the website, which is african-theater.org. African and you can reg register there. Um, we have different tiers of membership, obviously. So there's a membership for for those of us based in the global north, but we recognize the uh, the inequality of wealth and, and and opportunities around the world. So for those based in the global south, particularly based on the continent of Africa or in the Caribbean, uh, we have a differential uh, rate for membership, um, as well as a differential rate for students as well. Okay. So th those are the things I wanted to say about the association. There's a lot more that can be said, but I think it's uh, uh, I think that's enough for now. Um, in a, I'm going to introduce our speaker uh, for today, and then I'm going to hand over to her. So um, our speaker this afternoon uh, depends on where you're joining us in the world. It might be morning where you are. Is uh, 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 Associate Professor Ali Wash. Uh, who is uh, Alice, Associate Professor of Performance and Social Change at the University of Leeds in the UK. She's also Director of Postgraduate Research, and she's led the MA in Applied Theatre and Intervention for many years. Um, Ali has a background in prison uh, theatre, prison arts practice, art and mental health and community arts in uh, South Africa. Um, today, Ali is going to be talking to us about a topic uh, titled World Making Power language politics in and of art activism in South Africa. And I'm, I'm not going to uh, read through the abstract, which you must have seen on the registration page, but I'm going to hand over straight to Ali to uh, then uh, speak to us. So Ali, over to you. Thank you so much, Kene and colleagues that are joining from near and far. Um, I, I'm going to start with a couple of words um, to express my gratitude for the invitation um, and noting, of course, that this is Africa Day. So it's a great honor to be with you this afternoon or uh, whatever time it is for you. And um, thank you very much to Kenne and to AFTA for hosting. Um, afterwards, I'm very keen to take your questions or reflections um, into consideration. And um, it's also a great honor for me to present this work, uh, but I'd also like to reflect that it draws on collaborative work from the last three years with colleagues and young people. So I'll be citing them throughout. Um, it's not only my work, um, and I think it's important to bring their voices into the room. I'm also not gonna be reading a script today, so I'm going to hold myself to time. And um, so we also have a chance uh, to talk at the end. Um, and afterwards, um, please, if I forget, remind me, I will share some um, several links so colleagues can access 
Uh, Ali, um, we lost your connection at the point where you were talking about um, um, uh, colleagues who are joining us from different places. Okay, great. So um, I will uh, just wanted to add that um, this is collaborative work um, that I'm presenting on today, and um, I will therefore be citing the the young people and colleagues that I have been working with for the past couple of years, um, and also that um, I'm going to be sharing some links afterwards. So if you want to access. Um, the films, toolkits, or resources that I talk about, um, they're all online, open access, and you can take a look at them afterwards. So I shall start sharing. And I believe it should be good to go. So I'm going to um, try and just remove my myself from view because it's always very distracting. Um, and um, just begin uh, by uh, reiterating that the talk today is going to be focusing on a question of world making and power, looking at the example of um, arts education, arts activism in South Africa, um, and thinking through language politics. And I thought I would start with the voices of the young people who collaboratively created this, and it's meant to be a spoken word poem. And I will, if you bear with me, some of these languages I don't speak myself, so I will um, attempt to, um, to speak in, in them as we go along. We who speak Afrikaans, we who use art to express ourselves, we who are stripped from our mother tongue, Tina Seteta Uluimi Lomhlaba, we who are a Mengelmus, we who are silenced by fear, we who think, speak, we who speak, think on our feet, Tinofara Nemutauro Wedu, Tina Abukuluma Nkulu, Moyakwa Zulu Singama Zulu, we who speak the language of our ancestor, we who speak the language of peasants, we who speak the language of our masters, we who speak the language we want, ons viditaal van die onedrukkers praat, we who never have enough words, we who speak the language of shaka, we who speak the language of the used. And you can notice that through the, these examples, we've already heard a variety of languages and uh, attitudes to these languages um, and you can see some of, in some of these images the group of young people that we worked with throughout. So as we move into the talk I wanted to perhaps offer a couple of contextual points that you might draw from um, and consider any connecting points to your own local context. Um, and as you may know, South Africa has 11 official languages. In this project, we were focusing on race and space, and in particular, the ways that young people made sense of and experience how racialization conflates with and comes into contact with spatial politics. And where I'm talking later on a little bit more about language policies, this is obviously in the realm of official languages, but also in terms of the medium of instruction. And by that, I mean the language or languages that people are educated in for basic and, and further education. So, and these, these might all be very familiar to you in your, in your own context. Um, there's, there's often a proliferation of um, everyday languages both at the level of the language that we use, so that's our mother tongue or, or how we speak at home and or vernaculars, as well as how languages carry with them certain affects and attitudes um, that affect how people might feel about using those languages. Uh, as you'll see later on with some of the examples, language also contains within it and, and how we use language contains within it 
this idea of tensions and borders, including who belongs and who doesn't belong. And so in the example that, or, or several examples that I'll be talking through, I'm going to be considering collaborative arts processes as a place to explore these contested issues across difference. And I thought it might be of interest, especially in the locus of African contexts, rather than necessarily diasporic communities. Um, and holding also with, within um, one's mind the, the need to consider the imperial and colonial harms that are always with, with us in the context of Africa, and in particular in South Africa, apartheid harms that, that prevail as well. So um, how I'll be going forward with that is um, discussing very briefly some of the kind of informing ideas about world making, any cause epistemic injustice. And I'll just sketch some of the ideas that come from thinkers like Joanne Archibald, Sylvia Winter, um, Doreen Kondo, and Linda Tuhiwai Smith as well, just, just to um, flesh out some of those ideas. And then I'll kind of step towards the, some critical issues in participation before talking through this um, Arts and Humanities Research Council funded project, um, Imagining Otherwise, and Ilizwi Lenyaniso Lomplaba, which means the true voice of the land. Um, and some of the examples I'll be um, addressing in, in that section are around collaborative creativity, I'll demonstrate very briefly two extracts from the glossary of arts education. Um, I'll share with you critical comics that we created. And then I'll move to discussing the praxis of languaging freedom. Um, and then towards the end, I'll, I'll um, give some ideas or outlined um, thoughts on building theory from youth arts participation. And I'll very, very briefly introduce um, some thinking drawing from Olufemi Taiwo's ideas about redress, um, which are in progress. So I'm very happy to, to take some questions. Um, but ultimately thinking all of this through in terms of arts activism in the context of South Africa and beyond, and the imperative of youth consciousness raising beyond the formal curriculum. Okay, and we know this kind of activity goes on all across the continent. So I'm, I'm sure there'll be um, valid, viable uh, connecting points that you can offer in conversation. And I thought we'd kick off with not only this great image of one of our young, young people, but also with this quote from Joanne Archibald, who says, our stories are part of articulating our world understanding our knowledge systems, naming our experiences, guiding our relationships, and most importantly, identifying ourselves. If we understand that next to this provocation from the Jamaican theorist, Sylvia Winter, she says, empire's most powerful apparatus is the education system. It initiates us into a culture and knowledge system that instructs us to want to be of a specific ethno class of humanity. And hopefully we'll see an echo of that later on in, in the discussion. But she goes on to say, we cannot give up writing stories about what it means to be human that displace those that are at the foundation of empire. There is no order in the world that can exist or hold together, including an empire without a founding story. Now the question for us in the 21st century is, will you make space to be able to write a new foundation? And I thought this was quite a, a rousing provocation for us to think through as um, arts activists, as theatre makers and as educators. But more importantly also for us, we wanted to use this kind of prov provocative approach with our young people in the project. Um, and just to uh, remind everyone, you know, the, the images throughout are from this project, and I'm happy to speak more about them. Um, I'm not introducing each one separately for now. Um, but just another uh, few words from Sylvia Winter, 
who's talking about the coloniality of being, power, truth, freedom, that relies on the sense that one cannot unsettle the coloniality of power without a redescription of the human outside the terms of our present descriptive statement of the human. And in that sense, it's we were we were encouraged to think about really giving the young people new ways of understanding themselves so that they weren't consistently having to describe themselves in oppressive languages and in deficit terms, because that's very often a kind of knowledge base that sees certain racialized young people as deficit and as considering themselves in relation to a kind of more powerful presumed other. So um, I'm going to just touch here on, on um, Doreen Kondo's world making. Now she's um, an Asian American writing in the in the North American context, but I thought it was it was helpful to to draw on how she understands this question of the importance and significance of theater and performance as a place in which to to make worlds by, as she says, linking power, labor, and then she in includes gendered, racialized, classed subjectivities in historically and culturally specific settings. And she, in, in this really interesting book, she, she asks us to take a, account of everyday creativity and artistic production as modes of creation or world making. So in that sense, there's an emphasis on making and process. There's an emphasis on collaborative work and collective work, which we don't always find valorized in, in the global North, for example. Um, she also analyzes and explores how race and racialization um, come through embodied meaning making through performance. Um, obviously in, in the US context, it's, it's got a different inflection as well, but she wants us to, in, in this, um, understanding of world making, pay attention to syncretic forms and aesthetic approaches, which I have to say we are very accustomed to doing in the African theater analysis. So um, one thing that I would um, draw attention to from her work then is this question of a kind of transnational imaginary. So having in mind that sense of plurality and crossing that allows our ideas or our stories or um, our artistic and aesthetic forms to transcend fixity. So one example can be, we don't always have a single actor playing a single character throughout performance. Okay, so taking that as the starting point, I'm gonna move now to kind of zoom out a bit, a bit more and think about some critical issues in arts engagement and participation. Um, and this can be critiqued or um, acknowledged as having the history of neo-colonial approaches and aesthetics. So that might that might be um, a custom a customary sense of you know who a director, for example, or people feeling like they have to write a script rather than uh, collaborate and devise work in, in ways they may normally operate. We may encounter um, projects and processes in which African knowledge systems and aesthetics are subjugated to dominant approaches, um, in which language politics and representational politics are speaking first to a global audience before speaking to each other and the local audience. And these kinds of projects could be criticized as extractive, more for benefit of academic elites rather than uh, participants themselves or communities themselves. And they can sometimes have a tendency to homogenize communities in which these results can reproduce a kind of celebratory approach without always reflecting on tensions or failures. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a moment. But this sort of sets a, an, an immediate need for thinking about how do we run projects where we're um, drawing down uh, funding, for example, from the Global North without falling into the traps of um, these kinds of criticisms. And 
I quite enjoyed this image because I think it's a tennis ball rather than an apple, but this young person looks a little bit hungry <laughs> at, at this moment. Um, so, so just to connect that um, set of critiques to um, this ladder of participation that colleagues may be very familiar with from Sherry Arnstein, who was talking about from an organizational studies perspective or a development studies perspective, the different levels of participation uh, that are both authentic or not so authentic. And she and you can see there she's got a, a starting from the sense of not really participating all the way up to citizen control and citizen power. And, and I've just translated that in particular into the into the arts. Um, and in the top in the top blue one there you could see i've i've suggested that for appearances that could be you know uh, i'm going to ask this group to to take part in a patronizing or hierarchical way that could be more like diversity box ticking or window dressing if we go down to the next level it, we might say that that kind of project has good intentions where we might we might see the the ideas of development giving voice but that doesn't always giving voice i'm putting in quotes it doesn't always uh really um displace those neo colonial power dynamics for example if we move then down to towards collaboration that's where we may include consultation but it doesn't always recognize the barriers to participation that some people might face or partnership might be in that in that realm, and then um, at the at this other level, this kind of golden level, we've got co-performative witnessing, which is a term from Dwight Conkergood, and that's and that's where um, it links up with the Einstein idea of power sharing, in which the participants may affect decision making or um, think about deep collaboration, and these ideas moving at the speed of trust which you know very often international collaborations don't have the the time to move at the speed of trust um, and that's an idea from um, activist adrian marie brown and um, and also further this this last point there learning through failure um comes from work by colleague leila yankovic and um, david stevenson so on to the specific project. And those were all kind of um, ideas for us to take forward as we look into the, um, the examples. So um, feel free to ask questions about those as well as we go into the last part. So um, the two, these two projects, um, I was the principal investigator for Imagining Otherwise with, alongside um, Dr. Alex Sutherland, who was based at the Chisimani Center for Activist Education as well as UCT, and then Partners Bottom-Up School Development. So that was a small organization in Cape Town. And the Elizwi Lenyaniso Lomplaba team uh, was led by Dr. Scott Burnett, who's now at Penn State. Um, and of course, the participants um, who you'll see later on. So the young people in Cape Town, Imagining Otherwise group, and the Graf Renet group from the Eastern Cape were Elizwi. And in these images, uh, the, the young people are mixed. So you could see sometimes the, the urban youth um, and sometimes the groups mixed together. And in the, in the particular project that I'm kind of emphasizing today, but I have to speak about the others to, to get to that one, was this question of drawing together those two groups of young people. They had each separately completed um, intensive work through arts education. Um, and we wanted to bring them together because as we as we went, went through those projects, we realized that there was this question of the language politics that was remaining in both of those projects. And then we decided to bring the, the rural youth together with the urban youth to see what might they do together um, that would help us understand a little bit more about self-representation, language and culture, especially in relation to peripheralized youth. So these young folk uh, from Graf Renet, which is um, in the Karoo in the Eastern Cape in South Africa, 
call themselves Ilizwi Lenyaniso Lomhlaba, the true voice of the land. Uh, we were working with uh, the Support Center for Land Change, and the young people received training in filmmaking. They created over 40 films, um, and uh, subsequently we've had around four articles specifically about land and land politics, um, including a kind of spatialized and racialized understanding of land. Um, in this project, we wanted to really challenge them to make a more politicized film specifically about youth understanding of voice and participation in civil society. Um, and afterwards, when I share the documentary, you'll, you'll be able to take a look. Um, and in contrast, we had um, this other group from Cape Town, Imagining Otherwise, which were uh, a core group of around 25 young people from the Cape Flats and beyond. Um, initially, we thought it was going to be a fairly um, homogenous group, but it was very interestingly um, much more diverse than we had anticipated. So we had Afrikaans speakers and other languages. There was racial and ethnic diversity. And the main element of this was a collaboration with Chisimani Center for Activist Education and Bottom Up, as I mentioned. Uh, also worth saying that uh, the project started in March 2020. So mo most of our project initially was conducted online. But nonetheless, we managed to produce over 60 artworks, three digital toolkits and two arts toolkits. And those, um, as I said, I will share later. In the first place, as I mentioned, we were looking at uh, race and space. But as we brought them together, we wanted them to think about the, the particularity of language politics and the urban rural divide? Was there any tension between how young people in these different places were using language and expressing themselves? And the, the as it turned out, it was a, an opportunity to bridge the gap between arts activism and policy making. So to, to just mention here, I'm not going to um, just really analyze something in, in particular in this framework, but uh, I, felt, I found these five dimensions of decolonial activism and theory as struggle from Linda Tuhiwai Smith very, very productive in the analysis of some of the films from the, the Elizwi group. And she mentions critical consciousness, the importance of the imagination, the intersection of diverse and distinct social categories and discourses as well as instability and disturbance associated with movement. And of course, the underlying code of imperialism or what she calls a kind of structure to our contexts. And I'm not going to um, ask you to look at the whole entry here, but uh, just wanted to provide an example of the glossary of arts education practice. This um, extract is about WhatsApp, um, and as, as I mentioned, the whole project took place online, and we had to very quickly find a way of engaging young people that was cost effective. Um, and as many colleagues may know, it's it's much more likely to uh, to reach someone if you're able to use WhatsApp on the African continent rather than try and do a Zoom call, for instance which can always, sometimes be inaccessible. Um, and so we've, we've got these kind of um, cross-referenced words, um, Zoomism, for example, or quarantine art or justice. So we kind of trying to look at how, how various arts practices and decisions um, inform one another and become the, the praxis of arts education. Um, in this piece, I thought I would include the, the image here of this young person, Torek, um, introducing Iman and Tahira to the kind of speculative imagining. So if we take that idea from Linda Tuhiwai Smith forward, how do we really build a capacity in the young people for producing the world that they want to see in the future? by using really and, and becoming adept at using their imaginations. 
And in this example, it was about mapping spaces of hope and uncertainty. In, in this piece, um, these two young people uh, devised a neighborhood where houses were spacious and rent free, enabling people to enjoy their lives without stress about money. So you can you can already see that um, even in this example, you know, if, as you can imagine anything, you might you might wonder whether young people would say, "Ooh, I want to have a hundred pairs of Nike Airs," or you know, "I want to only eat ice cream for breakfast, lunch, and dinner." But you know, these two young people created the vision of social housing that doesn't yet exist in the South African context, um, which was quite a powerful example of where they're willing to put their imaginations. Um, and I'm also referencing this because it's all kind of cross art form um, and collaborating with, with colleagues with um, different kinds of experience. Um, so here, Tahira and Iman created a space that had different dimensions. So you could see some of the labels there. We've got an art shop, a surf shop. So they wanted, they wanted youth to be able to access leisure and pleasure in their lives, but also the library as a space for learning. Um, and in this dimension, they, they uh, imagined, you know, what if you could walk around a corner and it was suddenly safe, or you could go to some other suburb and you didn't have to feel worried about the rule of gangs. Um, and in the distance in this picture, you can see a, a dragon there. And, and in this kind of speculative imagining, there was a kind of safety dragon or a security dragon that could help keep young people safe. And I, I just wanted to shout out the collaborators we worked with as our co-producers, the wonderful Zodwa Nyoni, who um, is based in the UK, but from Zimbabwe. And then um, colleagues from Lode Film Factory um, and Seth Deacon from, from Fine Arts. And they kind of really took hold of those online workshops um, over the first year, encouraging people to keep taking part. And we also had um, youth arts leaders that we were training along the way. So Maggie Fernando did a project management role, um, as well as really holding a lot of the facilitation in her hands. And then um, UCT grads um, Tandi Lembacha and Kondiswa James, um, both excellent arts workers themselves and cultural activists. And in this one, I, I was wanting just to share a kind of second tier of engagement with a, with a different group of young people who were who were very accustomed to performing, and in this case, were making a a scene about um, a mugging. We, at, at, towards the end of the project, also um, managed to get some additional training in oral histories, and that comes into play in the next part of the power of word. So um, this is just a flag for the toolkit uh, in which colleagues can see the workshops, the um, support for facilitation, and how we used WhatsApp in, um, in the processes. And I'm kind of flicking through some of the images in the digital arts toolkits now that the young people put together, uh, collaging some of their, their own homemade videos, films, video art, um, but also uh, with, with sequences that you can see where they're talking about how to make powerful activist films or films that move towards social change. So learning about things like framing, how you do that on a mobile phone and how you can really address questions that are politically and socially urgent. Here's Edina. And once again, these uh, links will be available afterwards. So these are on YouTube and available. And I thought I would mention, you know, in this sequence, uh, you can see Peace Moore standing here, um, who speaks out about the importance of telling stories from below. And he uses a kind of collage effect, a bit of speculative fiction and um, some spoken word or rap uh, to speak back to the kind of level of 
invisibilizing that our politicians keep uh, leveraging on, on us. And to me, all of this sets up the need for plurality. So how the, the art forms that embrace plurality set us up towards world making. And here Amkpa says that a cultural construct enabling people and communities to define themselves as subjects of politically fluid societies is not only a necessity, but also an urgent political strategy for developing agency in a heterogeneous continent such as Africa. Here, the, the red thread that you can see here was a, was a kind of research mapping tool that we were using to um, ensure that the young people were, were also not just producing and producing artworks, but uh, also beginning to find themes and understand how there might be connecting points between their experiences, stories, and observations. Um, these things they shared in um, a youth symposium that was attended, um, as you can see, by some teachers on the right there. And I, I thought I would just flick through some of the project outcomes before going specifically on to speak about the power of word. Um, many of these things came out of this initial piece on youth voice and power by myself and Dr. Burnett. I've mentioned the toolkits and the comics you'll see. Um, I'm working on something about future redress and reparative futures. There was also in the bottom line, you can see there um, the critical reflection of um, an incident at Cape Town's Museum of Contemporary African Art, where our young people were racially discriminated against and the project team uh, decided to write something about that. Um, and of course, there were, there were plenty of live events and, and performances and panel discussions as well. Um, and, and so I'm going to launch from the, um, the comics themselves into what we then looked at in, in Power of Word. And this comic from Andre Trantral and the collaborator, um, Ashley Basaki is around the myth of meritocracy. So the, the school teacher, Mr. Edwards, is trying to get his young people from an underserved school uh, to participate in debate. Um, and when they notice the different kinds of privilege that this very rich and elite school has on the other side of town, they start, they start to make some sense of how meritocracy structures society. A second story that we have is on disposable youth. And these were all kinds of ideas and reflections that the young people gave to us. Um, so, the, so the comic itself is a, is a dialogic kind of output, as well as being quite, quite fun to read. So we also had the young people um, join us in workshops as to what they could take from it. And so bringing those groups together, we wanted to ask them these kinds of questions. Again, kind of visioning of futures that do not have language discrimination. What the role is of institutions, for instance, schools, universities, dictionaries, and how might we imagine a different future or a better environment? What might young people themselves also need to do? Um, I'm going to name check here. Um, one of the ins inspirations for this part of the project was Prof. Quentin Williams, who is based at the Center for Multilingualism and the Diversities Research Center, um, who is working on the trilingual dictionary of CARPS. So the beginning poem you heard had some CARPS in it, and we now move to um, how the young people started making sense of it. So they were introduced to this question of Cups, and here a young person says, the language I speak is seen as kham, or it's symbolic of a lower class. 
when I'm in certain spaces such as Cavendish Square or v &A Waterfront and I express myself phonetically, people's expressions immediately change as if I'm a crook or as if I don't belong. The language I speak excludes me at times from this, this space because of feeling unwelcome and the inexplicable need to work up the courage to confront it. Another young person says, I do not speak English very well, but it is my main form of communication. But because I do not speak it well, that also plays into the role I have to fulfill being a person of color. And that's that I have to perform excellence to get into spaces, whereas whites would be rewarded for mediocrity. And that's reflected also in that comic. So Afrikaps as a kind of project that I mentioned um, Quentin Williams previously, needs to be reclaimed from white supremacy. Why? Because Afrikaps is a dialect of Afrikaans used by working class communities on the Cape Flats that is about strategically reclaiming Afrikaans as a language rooted in Cape Town's history of slavery. It was quite exciting for the young people to learn that the first written Afrikaans texts date back to the early and mid 19th century and were written by Muslim descendants of slaves translating Arabic holy texts to Arabic Afrikaans. And that is completely counter to the all the stories we've heard, the, the colonial, apartheid, imperial stories of Africana nationalism that had previously essentialized the language and associated it with white supremacy. And yet today, Afrikaans is the second most common language spoken by Black people in South Africa. So when the group learned that CARPS was being recognized through a dictionary project aimed at validating CARPS as a language, as well as those who speak it, it really opened up their, uh, their world in a way, allowed them to see the language that they might otherwise feel ashamed of or feel they have to change or code switch into um, a, a different understanding of the value perhaps of language diversity. And the project wanted to think about the ways that young people use CARPs in working class contexts, as, a, as opposed to the school language that they might have to reproduce. Also thinking about how they might play that in performance. And, and we draw attention to this quote um, from Haupt who speaks about the stigma and identity of CARPs in particular. So he says, when people think about CARPs, they often think about it as mixed or impure, unsavor in Afrikaans. This relates to the ways in which they think about racial identity. They may think about colored identity as mixed, which implies that black and white identities are pure and bounded. So it's, as you can see from that quote, already quite a, a, a complicated political identity and language question all bound into how we may speak. So I wanted to include this image um, as the event in which the young people from Hrafinet shared their documentary and were greeted with enthusiasm from local activists and audiences who were able to discuss with them questions of power, language, and identity and how they work in those contexts. So in the last little bit, I'm going to just reflect on some of the learnings from oral histories. So it's not just what which language people grew up speaking, but also how they respond to and feel about language in school, and also how language is classed. Thinking through and how they, they started to make sense of language that includes or excludes, uh, and that is how people use their everyday language, youth slang, or um, represent themselves in subcultures. They found out that language brings access or it might bring barriers, as you saw in some of those comments. And those, those could be either work, leisure spaces or opportunities. 
And this feeds into that question of meritocracy, which has a kind of built in matching systemic racialized prejudice. And that can also go along with surveillance and self-management of language use. So that sense that, oh, I mustn't talk like I normally talk when I move into this kind of place um, or I'm going to be judged. Um, so that, as you can tell, goes along with a sense of internalized oppression. One, you know, one language is correct, good or righteous, and my language might not be. And I have to change myself or my language to do that. So in, those, in these interviews, I haven't included extracts from the interviews or it would get too long, but in the interviews, I, I was very interested to see that there's intergenerational misunderstandings quite a lot of the time. And that uh, comes from different ways of using language. So sometimes elders or parents getting quite confused about how the young people are using slang or, um, or less than formal language. and Interestingly, but maybe worryingly, there was also a certain tendency to romanticize past certainty as opposed to the chaos of today. Um, and when you consider that past certainty also went along with racialized oppression and policing, I'm not so sure that it was certain. It might just have been extremely more violent. And in the in the image here, you could see uh, you could see this young revolutionary in the in sitting in the um, activist education space, dreaming of a future without language discrimination. Well, what might life be like if there were no language discrimination? There wouldn't be different races in different areas. Youth would be able to enter to edu educate each other in their own languages. There would be wild varieties of Afrikaans. And someone quite controversially said there would be one language of medium uh, in, of instruction. But ultimately, most of them were, were wanting to see a system where everyone is included. And so thinking then about the um, how arts interventions build theory from youth participation includes a necessity to consider the positionality of researchers as well as everyone else. There must be critical engagement with group formation, and that's across all kinds of difference. What is specific that is afforded by the arts-based outcomes and how they might have helped to engage in the complexities. Uh, the importance of the and the predominance of the of the youth role in meaning making so not only as the producers of the materials but as the co-researchers for example so um, we decided to train youth in research skills like oral histories and how that helps to generate young people's insights into cultural and social meanings so what happens then when young people tell their own stories or are involved in stewarding other stories to me, this is the, the question of world building. Now, I'm going to hint here towards the themes um, towards redress, but I might skip over the table. And um, the, the question there is, you know, how, how do we not only um, valorize and um, lift up the, the excellent quality artworks that they make, but to consider how they act in the world. How do they produce a different world that we might want to see in the future? So we, we might use this idea of redress. When, when I say here, artworks are within precarious context, that's just the, the everyday lived reality of poor and working class young people whose perceptions of the future are very much curtailed by the current circumstances. So we need to be able to link the question of power and the value, values and impacts of participation to these wider social change endeavors. And that is because we, we can't just recognize and repeat past injustice, but we must move from hegemony, so the way things are, or that this is the way it is, to the question, what is to be done? And from there, we say, we see the need for critical hope. And I am gonna jump over that because it's a lot to read. But thinking with, with our colleague Olufemi Taiwo, the question of redress 
requires us to move to a constructive approach, so beyond critique. Arts education and participatory arts with young people encourages learning both about past injustices, but encourages also active rehearsals of ways of being for a different future. In that sense, arts activism is about envisioning the world we want to see and rehearsing it in the present. And in the Power of the Word project, thinking about linguistic citizenship enabled young people to test out the value of received ideas and limiting beliefs that keep people in place, technically. In that sense, we were in, interested in the creative potential of documentary filmmaking, research performance, and the arts to express contestation. So there wasn't always uh, agreement and consensus, but in that sense, the research must address both outcomes as well as methodologies, not, uh, not only focusing on, um, let's say, discourse analysis itself. Um, I, you can see I'm interested in valuing the research that the youth do themselves. And I'm going to very carefully come to an end, right? As, as I'm almost on time, we who come together in the spirit of activism driven by injustice, we who listen with all our senses and act to make the impossible possible, we who laugh, improvise, care, change gears, start again, build anew, we who bring our individual skills, concerns, and sensitivities together into a collective dream for social justice. We who believe that the arts can be radical, we who walk in uncertainty with heads held up high, form pathways for greatness, we who imagine otherwise. And I shall pause there, very, very happy to take questions, comments, or uh, further clarifications. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Um, I think I seem, I seem to have lost you. All right. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, that, that was uh, fantastic. Um, re really excited by some of the ideas that you uh, presented here. We're going to open up to questions, colleagues. Uh, like I said, do please put your questions in the comment section, or if you want, you can raise your digital hand and, um, and we'll come to you. Um, just uh, just before we uh, go to the uh, public question, just a couple of things. Uh, well, one thing for me here, a couple of things, but one thing really. Um, you talked about um, how the young people build capacity, so the, how the project built capacity in young people to produce the kind of uh, future they want to see. And I like the example you gave about um, uh, the young people that produce the vision of social housing, but they want to see if it does not, not existing yet. Um, is there what happens, um, especially because these young people are not just creating art for the sake of it, they are creating something they want to see. Is there a mechanism for making this transformational in the sense of how they live their everyday lives as well? So, how does it get into? Um, I don't want to say government because after all, every time we talk about government, but it's not always about government. How how does it get into community, into the way communities organize and and, and themselves? Yeah, I mean, this is always a, a big question, Ken. I thank you very much for that one. Um, yeah, I do think it's important not to not to raise people's hopes in that sense. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna create a better future but just not yet, <laughs> goodbye, uh, you know, come back in 10 years time for that future. The, I, I suppose the rationale for also um, making sure that these kinds of projects are very much in partnership with the local organizations that can be on the ground, whereas I, I was not on the ground because of COVID, I was just here at my kitchen table um, in Leeds. Um, but to to have that sense of the the capacity building as you know young people who take part in things who can who can perhaps consider their participation um, as they get more and more serious about things um, as kind of internships or attachments to these organizations which which leads towards paid work which might help in the future to to make life um, look a little bit different or have a different outcome. 
you know, this is also the, the kind of burden, I think, sometimes on arts projects. Uh, you know, we can't always promise to change living circumstances that people might be in in the present because I don't have the skills, for example, of um, architecture or house building or, um, or yeah, urban planning. But, you know, the second part of that project, the, the power of the word, was trying to say, okay, but actually there is such a thing as speaking to policymakers. So who is that policymaker in this case? It's the, not necessarily about the housing, but, but in terms of the language, it's this guy who's actually writing the dictionary, you know? So if young people can contribute to the dictionary, then that's their way of contributing to, to what becomes policy and what becomes legitimized in the level of policy, if you think about a dictionary in that way. And um, so that was quite a, a, a very short term, but, but quite a, um, a great potential in that sense. Um, and certainly, yeah, the, that's why, the, you know, to me, this, this kind of theory of world making always has to be within, within the specific context. It's not, it's, we can't ignore the constraints that the context pr produces. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, colleagues, um, ju just to say that uh, Ali has put some links uh, to some of the um, videos that uh, she spoke about in the chat box. And we're going to also put that on the YouTube where this video is going to be. Uh, so if you do have questions, please feel free to uh, indicate. And, and maybe while we're waiting for, for colleagues and their questions, I'll just add one more thing that um, I, I took out because I was rushing at the end, but uh, you know, one affordance that we had in the in the project was we were able to start a library in a school that had never had a library before, and we could uh, provide some interesting books about African consciousness, African uh, ways of thinking and viewing the world, um, as well as helping children in that school to to access spaces to learn and do homework and play chess and meet meet at lunch times if they wanted to. Um, so that was one, one additional um, interesting part of the project. Great, thank you. I still haven't, I, I can't see any hand up. Um, Amira, I hope I got your name correctly. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes. Hi, hi everyone. Um, so I'm actually a South African talented person uh, in the diaspora in the UK now. Um, and so your research has, has really spoken to a lot of the things that I'm working on. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak a bit more about the intergenerational discussions that were happening, particularly a lot around Africa and the usage uh, of that, because being from that community, I have a specific relationship to it. My parents have a specific relationship. Um, and yeah, whether or not there were discussions around how apartheid and the relationship of the colored community to apartheid impacted the usage of language. So if yeah. that makes any sense. But. Thank you so much, Amira. Wow. Um, it's the, the big pity is I was not around in the, in the time when they were doing those oral histories, but I've seen all the transcripts. And so what I could see there is quite an interesting set of tensions so that intergenerational uh, misunderstandings quite a lot of the time um were not they weren't only about cops use but but about attitudes to um to space to policing to securitization to you to behavior i'm going to say um which yeah were quite i found quite difficult to read I have to say, um, I think that definitely merits further research. I'm not sure that we quite got got it right with the amount of time we were able to spend in in that sense in the field. Um, and I think I think a kind of very deep and sustained project of in, intergenerational um, not only not only sharing but um, but learning, I'm going to say. Um, would be really, really valuable. And I'm, uh, I'm pursuing that with our bottom-up colleagues um, and hopefully some colleagues in UCT. But I think that, I think, yeah, it's, it's really wonderful, especially for, um, 
for researchers also in the community to be to be leading on that kind of thing. So I'd be delighted to hear more about your work too. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, uh, Kenna, you just muted, but I think you were asking any more questions. Any more questions? Yeah, you read you read my list, right? <laughs> okay, um, Hartley. Thank you. Thanks, Ali, uh, for the talk today. I'm curious to know, um, you know, you have, you outlined some of the, the big takeaways. Was there anything unexpected uh, that the youth shared that you didn't necessarily um, hypothesize or predict or anything unexpected that came up from their conversations in the project? Oh, such a good question, Hartley. Thank you. Um, you know, the truth is working with youth, you're always going to be surprised. But you might you might have a certain idea in mind, and then every day you're just going, What is that? That came up really. Um, so two, three, two, three things occur. One is, you know, we had we had the benefit of Zodwa Nyoni, who's really a wonderful playwright. Um, and who is working with the young people on monologues via um online workshops. Um, I was I was surprised, not necessarily in a good way, um, by the prevalence of um, a quite odd gender uh, gendered ideas. So, for instance, working class and poor young people thinking, especially young women, thinking that there's going to be a, a rich guy who who gets me out of my life of poverty and, um, and my kind of hopeless future, right? And they would they would write these scripts. They were they were good fun, but I was like, oh, the the underlying theme there is of being saved by a dangerous guy, a blesser, right? Bev, thank you very much. Yeah, so this this kind of um, discourse was very prevalent. And I was I was quite depressed by that. I was like, oh, I wonder if there's other ways of um, of imagining that. Um, you know, in terms of the writing, it was very it was very interesting. Um, I think it, otherwise, you know, <laughs> there there can sometimes be a, um, a a sense of seriousness that we that we bring to sometimes the structuring of these kinds of things so for example when we went to the museum of contemporary african art we were we were thinking it's so great you know we bring the young people to the to this amazing museum it's really it's really engaging and thrilling space to be um in terms of the art but actually the young people were already three steps ahead of us and had brought three changes of clothes and had decided on their selfie uh you know, um, route through the space. And, you know, on one level, we could have been disappointed, but on another, it was also just like, okay, well, this is actually what youth is right now and how people engage in space and seeing themselves as belonging in spaces in different kinds of ways and how they might perform place and belonging um, differently to how I might have done back in the day where I might have been a bit more nerdy about it, maybe with the with a notebook or something. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna say those two examples hardly, but I'm sure there were loads more <laughs> that, that I could think of. Thanks, Ali. And what I really love about your second example is just how the youth are creating art in an art space. Yeah. Uh, like, where I agree when I was younger at museums, I had a notebook or I didn't have anything on me. And it's cool to see what technology is now giving youth how they can create uh, create art while being in that space. So thank you. Yeah, great. And maybe I'll just extend that as well because I think one of the um, one of the films that's on the YouTube channel is is also you know a young person reflecting on you know how amazed he is at the architecture. So we were drawing attention to the contemporary African art, and he was like, "No, the building itself is really great." And you know, I would I find myself inspired by that and and imagine that maybe as my potential career in the future. So, uh, you know, that's, yeah, as you say, you can't always predetermine what people are gonna focus on at all. All right, thank you. Uh, we could take a couple more questions. We've got, we still got a few minutes to go. Uh, Matthew, please unmute and speak. Um, thank you, uh, Ken A. Um, I'm I'm Ali's colleague, so I feel like I'm hogging this space a little bit. Um, uh, Ali, I, yeah, uh, 
love the presentation um, and amazing work, which I'm sure we'll get to talk about more um, in the staff room at work at some point. Um, I just wanted to ask um, a lot of the kind of discourse coming from the young people directly, social justice, certainly politics around race, certainly, you know, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but our kind of left wing progressive ideas in that way. I, I just wanted to ask more of a question out of curiosity, really, whether the young people ever positioned themselves in that way as maybe left wing socialists, or was it just the rhetoric of social justice without ideologically knowing where they position themselves? I just thought that was really interesting. Hmm. Um, gosh, I, I'd be keen to um, to hear other colleagues also reflect on that. Maybe Amira has has notions as well. Um, but I think uh, in in general about young people um, mm. at the moment, because I haven't lived in in the South African context for a good number of years now. But you know, my impression is that there's not there's not necessarily so much self conscious um, attachment to labels like socialist or left wing um, necessarily so much as there is a kind of general affiliation to certain party politics uh, just because of how um how yeah historically that's operated across across the country but that's not unproblematic given that the state is in a complete disarray and all the opposition parties are also in a complete disarray um i think Quite surprisingly to me, the, the partner organizations themselves were fairly left-wing radical organizations. And so that most probably changed who we got access to in the first mm. place and the kinds of rhetoric and discourse that they were already accustomed to hearing about. So in, in a very recent example, one of those young people you saw in the picture, Tahira, has done the, she's been a library intern in the library that we started. And she is more and more and more using very much self-consciously radical left-wing language. And, um, you know, the, one of those comments about, um, you know, white people not having to uh, to try as hard for sure. And the kind of question of meritocracy, she's she's very much um, using the, the model of um, critical pedagogy that she's been steeped in in relationship mm. to the the project, but before the project and after the project, that organization bottom up. So they do really fantastic work, um, but I would say it's fairly explicitly uh, left wing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Thanks, Lovely. thanks, thanks Ali. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We've got Oluchi. Uh, please unmute. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Ali, for your talk. I must say it was very enriching for me. I uh, just, mine is not a question actually, but just to kind of make a comment that I find um, and a, some kind of encouragement in what I see. Um, I think I see from the very first part of your presentation where you were talking about the languages. First of all, let me thank you for making me know that there's a language, so to speak, called Afrika Afrikaans. Yeah. Never heard of it, that's my first time of hearing it. So now, but apart from that, in that particular part of the presentation, I saw somewhere where it says, we who never have enough words, that even in the midst of all of these languages, in the midst of all the languages that you mentioned, still they don't have enough words. But then later on, another part of the presentation, it was said, will you make space to be able to write a new, I think, foundation also if I got it right. So I kind of see a transition from a people who never had a voice, who didn't have the language, to now, uh, to them now, it is no longer about, I mean, it's like they've taken on ownership of the situation to create the space for themselves and to speak the language they want to speak using the arts. And I find that very, very, uh, uh, I mean, very interesting, very rewarding, I should say, for you who went into the project. So like I said, it's not a question, but just to make that observation that I kind of uh, identify with that and I, I like what I see. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much. It's wonderful to hear that. And yeah, I think a, a kind of, we can never be too encouraged, you know? <laughs> we need all the encouragement we can get 
at this moment. So, so that's very nice to hear. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucy. Okay, we've got Bev. Please unmute and ask your question. Oh, Bev, one moment. You just muted. You need to unmute first. Unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, okay, right. Um, it's really nice to hear about this um, Opricons and the COP kind of um, tall coming through, you know, and uh, I find it really interesting because I've been doing various projects all over and uh, people kind of say to me, um, oh, you must have had a very hard time in apartheid South Africa. And I look at them and I say, hmm, yeah, maybe. And then I realize, of course, they think I'm colored. So, you know, that's the, it's like this whole perception of who and what and where you are within the world. And don't come and live in Germany because, you know, you're going to have a hard time or the Netherlands or whatever. And I just kind of look at them and I think, well, there you go. What I liked very much as well, I mean, your pro project is absolutely fantastic. And I've just been working on a project in Cape Town, working with the decriminalization of sex workers, also using theater and arts, et cetera, et cetera. But I like the, the one that you said about speaking to the global audience rather than that local audience. I mean, that is so much what we're doing as academics, isn't it? It's like appealing to like what's out there instead of thinking about, you know, well, who we actually make in our work for and who's the actual the audience for it. So I just want to know how you felt about, about that particular aspect of, of, of everything, of that particular topic, you know, yeah. Thank you so much, Bev. I'm I'm keen also to hear more about the the sex work project, but I'll I'll. Uh, I'll just you know, I'm I'm not a sex worker. No, no. <laughs> you, you are working with the sex work project, <laughs> the decriminalization. Yeah. Um, thank you. And um, I think the, you know, the the rationale in the first place for me taking on any funding from the UK state is to try and push it away from from the UK and um help the help make sure that majority of the money or at least as much as possible can go to um the global south partners so that's the first challenge because obviously there's a bunch of hoops to jump through to make that happen but but really the impulse there was was to that sprung from the partners, especially um, Alex Sutherland, so at Chisi Money Center for Activist Education, who was going, you know, actually there's so many projects in different kinds of areas in Cape Town, but almost none in the in the um, Cape Flats specifically. And so that's why um, she was keen to, to start that off. And the whole design of it was, uh, at least the, the intervention part, was almost without any attention at all to the to the rest you know what was going to come later to the you know what what counts in terms of um promotion and tenure or um, cv lines or anything like that it was to enable that initial engagement with the young people and with the partner organizations to be authentic and meaningful and as hopefully not extractive as possible and yet of course and that's why i also included that little section on participation because Inevitably, if you're doing a short term project and you've got funding and you have to produce this, this, this and this and then produce a final report or there's kind of reporting deadlines that are not within my gift to say, OK, we don't need to worry about that, for example, um, there, there is an element of a kind of direction of um, of obligation, I'm going to say, on, on behalf of the, the organizations working in the global south context. Um, which can be very challenging. So, uh, you know, I tried my best uh, to minimize the uh, the struggle on their behalf, but I don't think I entirely um, ameliorated that that problem. Um, and I don't know that it's possible to do that with the power the power operating as it does. So I think that you know, if I was going to give um, advice, <laughs> if I was gifted that uh, that opportunity, I would I would encourage colleagues to to plan the the intervention part and the arts based practice as as far as possible to to meet the needs and um and re requirements of the local uh, participants and communities around them what's going to be meaningful the, for them rather than what's going to be meaningful for me because i can find meaning in almost all the <laughs> elements of the project 
And um, if I was left to my own devices, I could probably still write loads more about, about this project. Um, but, you know, for instance, sometimes I see colleagues saying, oh, we should, we should do um, a co-authored journal article with, with young people. And that's a good idea, but it actually takes a whole lot of time and effort and they don't necessarily care in the same way that we do. They might like to present something written, but does it have to be a journal article? Can it be a blog? Yeah. Can it be, you know, can it be a magazine article? Can it be something else? So it's the form that you choose then. That's like if if that can be authentic and grounded in the in the context, whatever that context is, then it's going to speak better to that to that audience. Because they can identify with it more, like the yeah. comics and everything else, yeah, and making the videos, sure. Yeah. Mm. Well, you know, even the comics, I would say, um, I very much like them, and yeah. they're, they're potentially parts of the comics are a little bit difficult. So it depends on exactly the age range that we would want to reach with them. So they've now gone out to 3,000 schools across um, the Western Cape. But I'm not particularly sure that that they reach, let's say, 14 year olds necessarily. Yeah. So I think we, you know, we maybe missed a trick in terms of the level of language use, for example, or the the amount of information that we were trying to get in there. But it's, uh, you know, only you only have such a short time, so it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, thank you very much. This was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Bev. Yeah. You. Pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone. And we've got a comment in the chat from uh, uh, Shola Demi, which says, thank you for this intervention, Elaine, um, for understanding the challenges um, you must have faced, more particularly from the authorities. I wish that similar projects that I was involved with in communities around PMB had achieved such success. Thank you. So on that note, I want to say a huge thank you to uh, Professor Ali Walsh. So uh, join me in saying thank you, Ali, for uh, the lecture. And also thank you um, to our audience. Thank you for uh, to every one of you for um, your patience uh, with the initial technical glitch at the beginning. And thanks for your uh, uh, participation as, as well with the questions and the comments. Um, finally, before we go, I'm, I'm going to launch a very quick um, uh, poll. Um, so it will appear on your screen any second from now. Uh, if you could just complete that for me, that would be great. I'll, I really appreciate that. Literally going to take 10 seconds to complete. Um, that's it. Thank you so much. And once, once you've completed that, I just want to say thank you again. And do feel free to uh, log off and I'll be ending the call in a minute. And Ali, thank you so much for honoring our invitation. And thanks for a wonderful lecture. Thank you for having me. Bye.